what I told you. That's up to the day's office. You're about to get a real police interrogation breakdown like you haven't seen before. This one, from a body language perspective, isn't the most exciting thing in the world, but I promise you, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to love this when we tell you exactly what's going on. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, this is a young woman named Charlene O'Banion who worked as a detention officer and was accused and eventually convicted of having sex with an inmate. We took this video from a web page or from a YouTube channel called Laudify. Go give him some love. Make sure he gets lots of subscribers and you give him a lot of attention. This is a great one. I agree with you, Scott. You're going to learn a lot in this one. So we're uh, detectives. We're not like internal affairs or anything like that. So um, what is being investigated could be a criminal investigation and it could just be internal. But I tell you that to tell you that this... Is a voluntary interview. If you don't want to talk to us, uh, you're welcome to walk out at any time. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, let me see. We were notified um, of a possible improper relationship between you and uh, Jacob Parker. So we're here for that. And I just kind of want to talk to you about it and get your side of that story. I don't like the thought it. I will. Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he's, yeah, he's in pot six. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that he's just a trustee that we have, you know, around. And, um, okay. Have you talked to him on any jail phone calls or anything like that? Uh, no. None at all? Okay. Is that cell phone number you gave me? Is that a cell phone or a house number? It's a cell phone. Okay. Do you have any other cell phone numbers by chance? Mm -mm. Um, where are you typically assigned in the jail? Uh, it depends. Sometimes I'm in pod five. Sometimes in, I'm in like today I'm in e quad. Sometimes I'm in e quad. They kind of just all move this around. Okay. And where is Jacob a trustee at? Uh, I think he's in laundry. I've seen him in laundry. I don't think he's out on the floor. Something like that. Okay. And where would you think that, like, this allegation will come from if there's, like, if there's nothing to it? Um, well, I had a feeling this was coming. So there was an inmate um, named Coker, Justin Coker. Okay. And he got out of, he got out of here for, I don't know what period of time. And he tried to contact me on Facebook. And he sent me a message, and I blocked him on Facebook. And um... All right, Greg, what do you got? This is a really good story because this is a story about familiarity, too much familiarity with prisoners. And, you know, we always say that interrogators become the bastard cousins of the prisoners because we live so closely with them. We start to identify with them. There's too much familiarity with law enforcement. She thinks this is an HR interview. These are murder. These are homicide detectives coming to talk to you. They're not coming to find out if you violated the policy on how much Kool-Aid you brought to work. This is a trap, and she doesn't realize it. She's in a bind. There's When he says the keyword criminal detective, criminal detective, she seems to not notice that for some reason. I would notice that immediately. Go, oh, hold on, hold on. I think I need somebody else in the room. She starts to talk, and that whole thing, I, I watched a thing on Angola Prison. If you guys know Angola Prison, there's a, a series, I forget which network it's on, and these inmates are friends with these people who've been there for 30, 40 years as guards, and they've watched these guys grow old and even die there. And it just is to explain to you, you'll watch, they develop relationships because they're human beings interacting with other human beings. Most of them are not going to have sex with a guard or that kind of thing. But in this case, she does something really stupid. I, I, Scott, and with you, you said there's not going to be as much body language, but there is some. There's some here. Mm -hmm. She she tries to do, what was his name, Harden, the sheriff who locked himself down, mm. which is a mistake always, always. When we teach people to resist interrogation, we don't teach them sit and hold the chair and try to grip. We teach them ways of, re, of resisting, and that's not one of them. I'll just leave it at that. She's making the same mistake he's doing. There's one of my favorite things you'll see in this entire video, this entire time. When you are in disbelief and you cock your head at somebody, there's a facial expression that goes with that. You may raise your brow or do concern or smile, but you don't go and whip your head right back. 
she's like Amber Heard clicking that switch and then her head just flips right back. There's no disbelief. She does, she swallows her words. She does fading facts and does an um before she answers. And look, we would expect her to be demonstrative about anytime she's, and emphatic anytime she's saying, I didn't do it. Not necessarily about it, I didn't know the guy, but let's pay attention and see as she goes through there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And there's no denial here, no surprise, no shock, no confusion as to why these questions are being asked. As an investigator, that's the moment. Like, you, sh that's where I should be, okay, I'm talking to the right person at, for, for what I need to do. So her answer to being accused of being in an inappropriate relationship is essentially to explain who he is and which pod he lives in. That's the answer. Oh, yeah, here's who he is, and here's the pod that he lives in. And she says, I don't know anything about it, about the relationship. I don't know anything about it. That's what you say about someone else's relationship, not your own. If, you, if, it, if you're not involved in a relationship, you say, I don't know what that means. That didn't happen. That doesn't exist. Not, I don't know anything about it, as if it's happening somewhere. So there's an instant shift right here when she says this uh, to chest breathing. There's an instant increase in breathing rate, which is how often we breathe. We, these are both associated with high stress, potentially fear. And there's an increased blink rate, which she starts blinking more often. So this is a stress indicator. And the eyelashes, when somebody has those eyelashes on there, they really help people like us to be able to see those stress indicators. So the detective asks, do you have any other cell phone numbers? And she goes, mm -mm. I don't even know if that came through or if Zoom muted it. But No, you got it. Okay. And with this brief little interrupted head shake, then followed by lip compression, which is withholding opinions or withholding something, then there's a tiny little no that comes out. This is the perfect fading facts which I'm gonna throw it right to Scott after this to walk through what that is and the history of that. There's a lot of info coming out about the non-issues here. Every, all the information is about stuff that is not pertinent. So we should wait to see more though. Let's not make any judgment because way more is about to be coming out. There's a weird thing that I've seen happen with people when they lie. It's not scientific. There's a tendency to gesture with the non-dominant hand during narration. So when it's illustrating, the hand doesn't matter. So think about a gun or a phone or even like a stick shift like this. When demonstrating that, it should reflect handedness. It's a big deal. This is the difference between na body narration, which is showing what something looked like or an action that someone took, and illustration, which I'm doing right now now, which is a non-specific use of the hands to speak. So a non-specific, I, I would say as an illustrator, specific, if I'm talking about how tall a building was and I put my hand up, that's a narration because I'm illustrating, I'm showing what something looked like specifically. So for the first time, we're seeing a group of detectives where I actually trained their department in Montgomery County. So I'm excited to see how this goes. I don't think either of these detectives were in my course I can't see their faces. And if they were, I don't recognize them and I apologize for it. At the Behavior Panel, our goal is to help you see behind the surface to spot deception and analyze the true intent behind people's words. It is a mission that I personally feel strongly about in especially in today's biased and overwhelming media landscape and mainstream media tends to blur the truth and make it really hard to see through the chaos. This is why all of us are proud to have Ground News as a sponsor. They help readers look beyond the mainstream narratives and uncover the patterns in the way that today's news really spins and frames the issues that are going on, or even just fails to cover them in the first place, like they don't even talk about it. So Ground News really helps you see the subtle ways that the media can very heavily shape our public opinion. I'm not even immune to it after studying all this psychology stuff, and it's good to be able to see behind the curtain.
I'm actually in the process of writing a book. It's almost done on media brainwashing. And I think they're one of the most practical solutions that I have ever seen. Just scan this QR code or go to ground.news slash TBP to get started. Our viewers enjoy 50% off unlimited access. It's perfect for yourself or as a meaningful gift that sparks some real understanding. Ground News is independent and fully subscriber funded. Join us today in bringing clarity back to the conversation. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, uh, everything so far is, is spot on. Like I said before, this is going to look really boring because it looks like she's just sitting there, but it's those little things we're looking for. It's those little things we're listening for. That's why I've all got shits and giggles because there's so much going on here and she doesn't realize what's happening. And as, as when we talked about going in and, and you uh, get up somebody's hind end about something, this guy's doing this, but she doesn't realize that's what's happening. That's what's so great about this. Now, when at the very top of this thing, she looks really relaxed. She's just sitting there thinking, well, whatever it is, you know, it's like one of those meetings we have, and I'm going to be able to uh, deal with this and move right along. That's what she thinks is going on. That's the way she looks about that. Her her um, her body language is open. Everything, she's just sitting there just relaxed, just waiting for whatever he wants to talk about in this. Her, her bl blink rate looks fine. We don't see much stress at all for, out of the ordinary from being in a situation where you've got to go talk to somebody you're gonna be a little stressed there but nothing out of the ordinary that shows it's been jacked up you know so then he said um when the interrogator says do you know what i'm talking about and uh she just talks about this guy like she just like she just knows him you know she knows who he is and that's it like she you know somebody you talk about at work that doesn't work where you do but they're in the building but you know who they are that person like she doesn't have any problems saying that? Yeah, you know, like I know who, she, who he is. Then he says, have you talked to him on any jail phone calls uh, at all? And then when she says, mm, mm, no, like that, that's a red flag. That's a red flag right there because that no is high. That There's a little pause there, that mm, that mm thing. No, that's, that's one of those things you see and you go, yeah, man, I got me one here. In a few minutes, we're going to see him get a little bit fired up and get worked up, but he hides it really, really well. So then he says, um, does, uh, does he have any other cell numbers for you? And she, she has what's called stress, or what I call stress mouth. It's compressed lips. And uh, she says, mm -mm, again, like that. So again, when you have st when stress mouth shows up or compressed lips, you're trying to hold something back, or you're you've got internal dialogue going on, and you know you shouldn't say anything, so you know what the answer is, but you're not going to say it. That's why she says, mm -mm, and that's why she has stress mouth. And then uh, after the last question, we see a small illustrator. Not much going on there at all. So this lets us know there's not not a lot of stress flare flaring up on her yet. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, I think this is this is great because when we get to video eight, uh, w when we do these, especially these interrogations, there's often a, a point where I go, God, if only they asked the, this obvious question here, it would lead to in video eight, they ask the question and it gets the confession that, that you just go, why didn't they just ask this question so you got to hang out there's a reason you, yeah. yeah yeah yeah. you got to hang out for that you got to hang out for that because they ask the question and they get the result it's 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 amazing uh, but but everybody's right there doesn't seem to be a lot of body language going on here so i'm going to focus on just one area because i think you know there's so much you can look at in terms of body language but sometimes being really good at something is about not doing a whole bunch of stuff and just focusing on a specific area she is relaxed. You're right. She's relaxed, uh, Scott. But just like Greg's saying, she's locked down as well. She's relaxed Ooh. and locked down. She's back in the chair and locked down. And so, Chase, to your point, that breathing, that breathing comes across, therefore, as defensive, not aggressive, but defensive. It's quite, it shifts and it's quite high. With that back and locked down it looks like she's just about to go on the roller coaster ride of her life and she knows it's about to happen because she's locked down in that um uh, non-dominant hand as you were talking about which for her is the left hand i started to look to see whether she was left-handed or right-handed had the the video been switched around i think the video's around the right way so i think um that she's using or what i'm going to focus on is her non-dominant hand her left 
hand as far as I can I can see it. Again, it's locked down until that point where there is a subtle finger raise on I blocked him off Facebook and the I is elongated. I blocked him off Facebook. That one finger is so out of the baseline for the rest of it that I just went, you know what? I'm just going to concentrate on that hand and that arm pretty much all the way through this because I think that will tell me a whole bunch. So I'm not going to pay a lot of attention to anything else. I'm just going to focus on on that and I'm waiting for video eight where this, for me, there's this amazing moment where somebody asks a question which does the job. I mean, they've, le they've led up to it, but it really does the job. So let's, let's get on with it. So we're uh, detectives, we're not like internal affairs or anything like that. So um, what is being investigated could be a criminal investigation and it could just be internal. But I tell you that to tell you that this is a voluntary interview. If you don't want to talk to us, uh, you're welcome to walk out at any time. Okay. Uh, having said that, uh, let me see. We were notified um, of a possible improper relationship between you and uh, Jacob Parker. So we're here for that, and I just kind of want to talk to you about it and get your side of that story. I don't like the thought it. I will. Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, he's, yeah, he's in pot six. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that he's just a trustee that we have, you know, around. And, um, okay. Have you talked to him on any jail phone calls or anything like that? Uh, no. None at all? Okay. Is that cell phone number you gave me? Is that a cell phone or a house number? It's a cell phone. Okay. Do you have any other cell phone numbers by chance? Mm -mm. Um, where are you typically assigned in the jail? Uh, it depends. Sometimes I'm in pod five. Sometimes in, I'm in like today I'm in e quad. Sometimes I'm in e quad. They kind of just all move this around. Okay. And where is Jacob a trustee at? Uh, I think he's in laundry. I've seen him in laundry. I don't think he's out on the floor or something like that. Okay. And where would you think that, like, this allegation will come from if there's, like, if there's nothing to it? Um. Well, I had a feeling this was coming. So there was an inmate um, named Coker, Justin Coker. Okay. And he got out of he got out of here for I don't know what period of time, and he tried to contact me on Facebook. And he sent me a message, and I blocked him on Facebook. And um... so uh, I'm just not trying to be rude here. I'm just, okay. why would you expect this conversation to come up from that? Like now, if that happened a few months ago, I'm just I'm trying to get where you were getting at there. Uh, you said you were kind of expecting oh, so something like this. I don't know why, like, this... I'm wondering if, like, Coker maybe said something, like, to get him in trouble or me in trouble. Like, I don't know if that's, that's the only thing I think that's, like, related that has anything to do with Parker. So I was kind of told this about, what do you think, Chris, about 45 minutes ago? Yeah, perfect. Um, so I don't know. I don't know exactly where, how it started, like, who it started from. Um, but I was told... Um, that it was brought to somebody's attention and then we looked at jail calls um, and there's jail calls between you and Parker and all that stuff's recorded. So um, I don't think you're being completely truthful. Well, I, I kind of know that you're not. And I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. Yeah. No. Um, I'm just kind of trying to lay it out on the table for you. Um, you kind of get one shot at this of being truthful and yeah. people perception means a lot in uh criminal cases and internal cases. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge deal. It sways people to do uh, a myriad of different things, you know, right. and this is kind of your chance to to paint your own image. Yeah. So can you kind of tell me uh, what's going on? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, whatever reason. All right, Chase, what do you got? Breathing rate, which is how often we breathe. It's kind of a stress response. We need more oxygen because ep epinephrine or adrenaline uh, demands oxygen. So our, we have to breathe more often. It's even higher here, and it's still going into the chest versus the abdomen. We breathe into the chest more likely when we're stressed, abdomen when we're relaxed. And she's talking about somebody saying something to maybe get them in trouble. And as she finishes talking, her hand flops like dead weight onto her leg. And I talked about this in the, just the previous video that we did. When somebody's using a limb or a hand to explain something in any way, and at the end of their statement, it just suddenly drops and kind of flops down like dead weight right at the end of that statement like you see here. I see this as a tremendous red flag. I don't know of any studies to support this, but I have never seen an innocent person do it when they're being interviewed. And keep in mind, it should go without saying that seeing this in someone talking about buying a pack of gum is different than if they're being questioned in a interrogation. The stakes matter. And that's why we have the C5 model to process behavior through. So when you confront somebody, it's always best not to reference them in the confrontation about the deception. When they say, you're not being truthful with me, a better way to say that in the future, I'm not saying they don't have, uh, they're not doing the right thing here, but it's just you might not be being truthful with, with me here, or you make it about yourself by saying, I might not be getting the whole truth. I've been doing this a long time, and there's one thing I can always tell is when I'm not getting the full story. And if you want to soften it a little bit more, I, you could say, I really think you're not being very straightforward with me here. So you try to want to uh, get them to create as low walls as possible to you. When he mentions they listen to the calls, she nods her head. When he says she's not being truthful, she nods her head. And I thought those were just fabulous. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, agreed, Chase. Uh, I'm always looking for that buoyancy in the gestures. Let's just say that they are, when the hands are buoyant, they are gravity defeating. The person may well be more optimistic when they become unbuoyant or, as I might call, leaden. In fact, sometimes you'll hear them hitting the table you'll hear jewelry or rings hit the table it's it's uh complying to to gravity of course to be buoyant against gravity takes muscles uh those muscles take brain power if you're busy being deceptive with other stuff it's harder to control the body and you end up giving up so there's a sense of defeat when people are not uh buoyant but look i'm just going to focus on this um this non-dominant left hand, as far as I can see it. And I'm just going to say this. I think her left hand becomes active and buoyant every time she's testing a story on this group here. Every time she tests a narrative, this hand suddenly gets active. So I would say... Um, uh, it was, so, so first of all, it's... it's, it's, um, it's uh, it's not symmetrical, it's asymmetrical, which is worrying for me. I would like to see more dominant hand if it were a true story. So it's asymmetrical, it's the non-dominant hand. It's only coming around with that sense of testing a story. Sometimes we get some slight upward inflections as well. We'll hear that as well, rather than downward inflections of implying that the story is correct. So I, I don't like a lot that's happening in here in terms of what she's saying is, is true about anything. But otherwise, She's pretty calmly locked down still. And so for me, it's only, though others will see other things, and I'd made a choice by, by now uh, just to go, okay, let's just look at this hand because this is really interesting. Uh, but otherwise, for me, it looks pretty locked down. So this left hand is all telling as far as I can see. Uh, Greg, what do you see on this one? Mark, I think if you watch that one hand, you're going to have plenty to talk about just <laughs> watching this video. And I think if you're watching this, Mark's dead on. Watch to the end. If you never have watched to the end, do, because this is a great exercise. And we'll talk about why they're doing the things they're doing. I'm going to talk for just a minute about interrogation. I'll cover a couple of body language things. So I'm of the belief that most interrogation is derivative of the work that Hans Scharf did, short of torture. Even Reed. Reed is a derivative version. That's my opinion. You guys probably agree. 
But what they found over time, and we'll talk about a study in a minute. I'll leave you that you're going to get our, our behind the scenes notes and I have a link to a study you can go and read uh, out of Gothenburg University where they tested some of this stuff. But all Scharf was about was trust and respect. And what he would do is come make you feel comfortable enough to talk to him. Then he would feign he knew more than he did or maybe take facts that were incorrect and check those against you and see how you would respond. In some cases, he might not know the answer. Great example. I did this in the History Channel, one of the few acting gigs I ever had that I got paid for. Mark, was, um, on the History Channel, I was um, playing the role of a downed American pilot, and a guy named Ash from UK was playing Sharp. And it, we reenacted this one where he asked a question. You must be running low on chemicals because you're using white tracers. Well, that was an indicator you're at the end of the chain, and you know you're going to run out of ammo, and you need to turn around and come home. And the guy he actually was talking to in real life gave him that information because he trusted him. He felt like it was just a conversation, walking along and talking. That's the way Sharfian interrogation works. So, Scott, you said something. She doesn't know she's being interrogated. That's the whole intent. In fact, what we know is that when in this study and in all my life in SEER and all those other things, we know that a person who is being interrogated using Sharfian technique has less awareness of the information they have divulged when the interrogation is over. They feel like it was a conversation. They don't feel like it was an interrogation. Whereas if you go headlong and start attacking and go direct, they know it's an interrogation very clearly. So when you hear about Hans Scharf, go look at this University of Gothenburg uh, study in 2014. You can see they gave 35 people information. And unlike most studies, Chase, we always talk about, they actually said the more information you hold on to, the more money you get at the end. So they gave them a vested interest, and they still gave up more information talking to that person than direct. So let's talk for a minute. She's got that feigned head cock again. People go like this, and they're like, what? And she does it so quickly, it just disappears. It looks so awkward. Right after the time she avoids, she does lip compression again. She, she has a blink rate increase. And then, Chase, I love that nodding. Yeah, and look at her chin boss. You talk about chin boss all the time. That's acceptance or grief. In this case, I think it's acceptance. Well, yeah, yeah, you got me. And there's probably shame, grief, something mixed in. But this is one of those times that we can see that they're using a mix of what I call sharfing interrogation and read. Because he goes, this is your one chance to tell me the truth. And if you've never heard read before and you walk into a room and you hear that, you should know that is the read technique, read method. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Now, this is we, this is the first time from her being all relaxed that we actually see stress cues, things that let us know that her stress is going up. Everybody's talked about a bunch of them, so I'll try to skip through a lot of these things. But we've got compressed lips, and we've got where she's chewing on her her, her lips on, on the side of her mouth. And then um, um, after that, uh, then that all that's after that she answers that first question. Now, as the interrogator starts unveiling all this evidence, we start to see things changing. That's when it starts to dawn on her. You know, she's a little bit. She starts pushing back just a touch. But when he says, "Can you tell me what's going on here?" she says, "Yeah, uh huh, or yeah, um, whatever you heard." And then she nods yes. So she says she's agreeing with whatever this they've heard on this this phone call thing or whatever, or whatever he's heard. That's what's happening there, and she doesn't want to say it. What's actually happened? So that there's I mean they've got her now pretty much from from that they know where they're sitting, and that little smile we're seeing in there that's not from Duper's delight. She's not getting away with anything. This is this is from embarrassment. So she's she's a little bit. Um, put off not put off but she's embarrassed by what's happened because she's thinking about it you know she's thinking i should have done that it was too easy to, to be able to, to to pull that off so uh it's and it's not duper's delight that'll smile isn't duper's delight i won't go back over all the stuff we've covered so far and we'll move on so uh i'm just not trying to be rude here i'm just why would you expect this conversation to come up from that like now if that happened a few months ago i'm just Trying to get where you were getting at there. Uh, you said you were kind of expecting oh, so something like this. I don't know why, like, this, I'm wondering if, like, Coker maybe said something, like, to get him in trouble or me in trouble. Like, I don't know if that's, that's the only thing I think that's, like, related that has anything to do with Parker. So, I was kind of told this about, what do you think, Chris, about 45 minutes ago? Um, so I don't know. I don't know exactly where how it started, like who it started from. Um, but I was told um, that it was brought to somebody's attention, and then we looked at jail calls. Um, 
and there's gel cost between you and Parker. And all that stuff's recorded. So um, I don't think you're being completely truthful. Well, I, I kind of know that you're not. And I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. Yeah. No. Um, I'm just kind of trying to lay it out on the table for you. Um, you kind of get one shot at this of being truthful. And yeah. people, perception means a lot in uh, criminal cases and internal cases. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge deal. It sways people to do uh, a myriad of different things, you know. Right. And this is kind of your chance to to paint your own image. Yeah. So, can you kind of tell me uh, what's going on? Um, yeah, I mean, whatever he's doing. Well, I don't want to, I want to know from you. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm not trying to go off rumor. I want, I just want to know what happened. It's, it's my job just to find the truth and that's it. Yeah. Um, I guess a few years ago, uh, we, we talked and then I ended up here and then he ended up here. I didn't know he was here. I didn't like, it wasn't anything like that. Uh, and that was that. Okay. So when you say y'all talk, like, kind of dated a little bit before you started? No, always, no. Like, he, he was never, like, my boyfriend. I just knew him. Like, the world. Okay. So y'all kind of talking in a sexual nature no. now that he's here? Oh, no, no, no. Now that he's here, no. Okay. I mean, it's never been, like, like phone sex or anything like that. Like, that's not. But, like, we all joke around. Like, we all make, like, you know. Like that's what she said, type yeah things, but it's never like. So what about some of these phone conversations? Um, no, no, not here or the phone. I no, I just mean conversations you are having on the phone. No, no, since he's been in here. Like, like sexual? Well, not. I'm not saying having phone sex. Talking about sexual acts. My, from what I'm listening to on the calls, I take it as that you've given him oral sex at some point. Is what no. I gather from these calls. No, that was like in the world, but we never like, we never dated. We just. Okay. But you've, you've had physical relationship with him when you were both out. Out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was before. Okay. That it was. We never like had sex or anything. It was just kind of like, that. You gave him oral sex. Yeah. Okay. But that was before like I knew he would end up here or that I would end up here or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. And what a. I know. All right, Mark, what do you got? Okay, so I'm going to give you a list of minimizations that she does, statements that she makes that says that things are less than what they might be, uh, negations that she does where she makes something a negative that we might assume might be a positive, and uh, I think chase what you'd call distancing, which is where she tries to remove herself from a potential uh, misdemeanor or crime uh, that's gone on. And every time I tell you one of these, I want you to notice when you go back and watch that she moves her non-dominant left hand. She gestures with that. So uh, in my mind, she is really trying to test a narrative that may not be fully accurate, that's a way of saying she's probably lying, telling a pork pie um, to the uh, to the detectives here. I just knew him from like the world. I just knew him. So that's a, uh, that's a uh, minimization. I just knew him from like the world. That's kind of a, a minimization as well. The world. I mean, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean the world? Be specific about that. In prison? That when they say the world, that's always the outside. Oh, okay. A, a super common thing, even in military prisons yeah. where I've worked. Okay, uh, thank you for the that. World, not the outside. Well, even right. in hardship tours, we say back in the world. You know. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, joke around. Joke around. So they were joking around. It's just comedy. It's just a laugh. Not. Not a crime by any stretch of the imagination. Not here on the phone, not here on the phone. So not here, okay? Uh, we never dated, we just, we never dated, we just, well, just what? Just what? 
again, minimization there and, and negation. Uh, yeah. Out, uh, that to your point, Chase, that <laughs> out could be a, a reference to the outside world. So I'm going to scrap that one out due to that information there. And kind of, kind of like that. So very unspecific, minimized, negated, and distanced there. All of that saying, all of that when said, the left hand becomes suddenly dominant in a way that it shouldn't. She is making up stories here. Behind all of those statements, there will be something bigger, something greater, something more incriminating, something that is more the truth and more accurate than what she's giving us right now. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. So I'm, I go through these by questions and what happened during the, right after that question. So as we go through this, after she answers, while she's answering the first question, we get the biggest, most pronounced example of fading facts we've ever had on this channel. And fading facts is this. When you ask someone a question and they start answering it, as they go along, the brains go, man, we shouldn't be doing this. This isn't the truth. So they start getting quieter and quieter as they go along with the answer. Until you get down to the end, you can still hear it. And it, we, we've seen it time and time again on here, over and over and over. But this, if you ever want an example of, of fading facts, this is it. Here it is, the biggest one we've ever had. She goes down to her, her mouth is just moving. You can't even hear what she's saying. So that's what a big deal that one is. Now, after the second question, we can add a couple of things to this. Um, we have the fading facts, obviously. And then she illustrates without emphasizing a word. Her hand just moves as she's talking. So... That lets us know there's inner dialogue going on up there. It suggests that anyway. And we, we know that she's she's thinking about what's happening. She's trying to structure a good answer. And, and she's backing up a little bit in her frontal lobe, trying to get an answer ready to let go to this guy because she isn't always going to ask next. And then uh, we start seeing for the uh, third question, we see more movement, but we see less stress. You know, so that's a little bit, I don't know if she's, she's thought she's got the answer. She's, she's going to be okay or what. But she moves around a lot more. And then for the next one, we see her adapting that hand on the leg, that little finger down there rubbing her hand on her leg. So that lets us know that her stress is starting to rise again. Adapters are things we use to get rid of that built-up stress and energy. Maybe it's um, a self-soothing thing like rubbing your uh, neck right here or rubbing your hand or chewing on your mouth like she was earlier or pushing on your face. Those are the kind of things we do to get rid of that, help us relax. In a couple of minutes, we're going to see her touch her mouth. And when you touch your mouth, that sends a signal to your brain to relax. So uh, we're, we're going to see a whole lot in here. I know I'm getting kind of giddy about this. I don't mean to be. And so she's confident uh, when she says um, that was before. And then the uh, strong illustrator, she has a strong illustrator with that. And her voice tone and volume are, are pretty good. They're pretty loud there. So I think she's confident with that part of it. I think she's being honest about that part. Um, when she says that happened before that we, we were in here before we came in. And then uh, again, the fading facts on that was before in here or anything like that. It just gets quieter as she goes along. Chase, what do you got? I agree. Uh, her initial explanation, the way she spits out how things just come to be is extremely revealing. Uh, if you're listening and you're using the slate language analysis tool to digest her language, you're going to hear vagueness, ambiguity, lack of detail, hesitancy, lack of denial, loss of fluency, fading facts, all of those being a four on the behavioral table of elements and on the slate tool. When somebody makes a denial and follows up with, I mean, and that's it. <laughs> There's no statement after that, just I mean. That's interesting. There's a difference between when she's talking about knowing him outside the prison and then performing these acts outside the prison. Huge difference in behavior. One of the gestures is huge, and one of the gestures is microscopic. You can see her hand. I knew him outside the prison. And like, oh, we did that on the outside. It was that dramatic of a difference. One is gigantic. So this gesture is directional. And it's helping to narrate that. So it's outside the prison. So something took place elsewhere. So we could call it narration. So when we see somebody gesture while they're talking about the outside world and then do it again in a way that's a foot lower and only involves a tiny movement, I automatically know where to direct my, uh, my attention and where the red flags are. So typically, 
you're going to see honest people use more, not always, but more symmetrical behavior when they're gesturing. Her right hand seems to be just glued to that thigh right there. And it's almost unmoving throughout this whole thing. So as mammals, all of us as mammals, us, bears, dogs, foxes, coyotes, uh, we all share this with our mammal relatives. When we feel fear, there's an instinct to stay still as we possibly can. And this is why you haven't seen a lot of movement in the chair. We have an instinct like, oh, something is potentially there. It's not definitely there. When we have a potential threat, we have a, a reaction of like, I'm going to stay still until I can identify direction or what it is or if I need to run. And that's all mammals are programmed to do that. So we see that kind of stillness, that lockdown while she discovers the veracity of the threat. And it, yeah, someone is going to have their limbs locked in one place because of that. Most of the time when you see that. And Greg was just talking about Hans Scharf. The, and he's the most famous interrogator in world history and one of the most brilliant when it came to it if you just think about what you do with your friends you tell them you think you tell them you know more than you actually do we all do that with our friends anyway you go on walks with them you develop rapport with them and you occasionally make fun of them that's the Hans Scharf technique you exaggerate how much you know and you and you treat them well and Hans Scharf as a cool fact, I just want you to know this as a cool fact while you're watching this video. If you've ever been to Disney World or even ever looked at a Google image of the entrance of it, there's a gigantic mosaic when you go in there with like 50,000 tiny little tiles. It's just a beautiful tile mosaic when you go into Disney at the main entrance. Hans Scharf made that. I'll let you just process that for a little bit. If you need some time, we can you can pause the video. <laughs> uh, uh, who else didn't go? Me, Greg. Oh, Greg. Greg. Sorry. Yeah, I'll add one for you. L.A. City Hall did all those mosaics too. So yeah, really gifted artist. Who do I know? Somebody recently told me a story that they had studied under him. One of their their instructors had studied him. Some art instructor. I, I'll remember who later. But whoever told me that, thanks. Interesting for me. I'm not going to repeat the same things you guys said. One of the first things I noticed in my dealing with deception in that is that women, think about a woman who's angry and a woman who is not angry and think of the difference in the way they may behave. Think about a woman who is seductive and how she may behave differently. One of the hardest things for a young interrogator male, especially dealing with women, is to understand that sometimes women are deceptive. They are hyper feminine. By that, I mean they cry. That's something that men like to think women cry, men don't. And Chase, you talked about it one time on here about the first time somebody cried, you thought, oh, she's innocent. And no, that's something else. Sometimes women cry from frustration more than men do. But one of the things that jumps off the plate at me here is her exposing her neck. That's an act of femininity and showing a feminine part of her body that immediately made me go, why now? Why is she doing that? And it's clear that she has identified these are not her friends at this point. You can see it because you see that rubbing the thigh. You see all that other stuff. I always will talk about women pushing their hair behind the ears. If you think about a woman who is enraged, none of that's going on. But when they're feeling compromised in that position, they may do that to expose that. Now, you will see some women who expose their throat like, yeah, go ahead. But it's more common for you to see it in deception or in feelings of stress that way. Somebody's going to be pissed about that one, but that is what it is. Uh, she qualifies, I would never do phone sex. I'm with you, Mark. Those qualifiers are interesting. She does that adapter on her thigh. This is just an interesting thing. One thing she's doing is she is answering questions and not providing information. She's forced into a box, and so she's going to answer whatever you make her ask. And, Mark, this is a good indicator that what they're doing is they're trying to see what she will give. Is the reason they're not asking the hard questions. They're going to paint her into a box, and then they're going to tear the lid off and say, hey, here's your only way out. And they do a beautiful job because here they could have made some really big mistakes by pushing too soon and have her ball up and go, I want an attorney. But they don't. They do a great job. Thanks. A lot of times what I've noticed in, in the music business, there are musicians who are great musicians. They're really famous, but they're great artists as well. So a lot of people who are, who are good at one thing, th that lets you know, that, or I'm under the impression that, that interrogation is more of an art than anything else. There's a protocol you follow, and it's analytical and all that. But I, I think I've told you guys, I don't know if I've ever told you guys this before, but that, that I, I'll tell you now, I'm an artist. 
Now I want to share something with you. I'm, I think I'm an okay interrogator. And this is something, this is just, I've never shared this before. This is just one pen. I used a red uh, Sharpie to do this. And it's, it's our dog Hattie. And I'll tell me what you think. Looks just like her. Exactly yeah. like her. Genius. Genius. Yeah. So you can be good at one thing and also be an artist as well. Or you might not be good at anything. In this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want. I want to know from you. Like I don't. Yeah. I'm not trying to go off rumor. I want. I just want to know what happened. It's, it's my job just to find the truth, and that's it. Yeah. Um. I guess a few years ago. Uh, we we talked, and then I ended up here, and then he ended up here. I didn't know he was here. I didn't like, it wasn't anything like that. Uh, and that was that. Okay. Yeah. So when you say y'all talk, like, kind of dated a little bit before you started? No, was, no. Like, he, he was never like my boyfriend. I, I just knew him from like the world. Okay. So y'all kind of talking in a sexual nature no. now that he's here? Oh, no, no, no. Now that he's here, no. Okay. I mean, it's never been like like phone sex or anything like that like that's not but like we all joke around like we all make like you know like that's what she said type yeah things but it's never like so what about some of these phone conversations um uh, no no not here or the phone I think no i just mean conversations you are having on the phone no no since he's been in here like like sexual well not i'm not saying having phone sex talking about sexual acts my, from what I'm listening to on the calls, I take it as that you've given him oral sex at some point, is what no, I gather from these calls. No, that was like in the world, but we never like, we never dated. We just. Okay. But you've, you've had physical relationship with him when you were both out. Out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was before. Okay. That it was. We never like had sex or anything. It was just kind of like that. You gave him oral sex? Yeah. Okay. But that was before, like, I knew he would end up here or that I would end up here or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. And what, uh, I know, um, what kind of conversations have you had with him since you've started working here and he's been in the jail? Uh, I don't know, just talking about what would happen after he got out. Okay. And then the jail call recordings, have you been talking to him while you're at home? Like he calls you from the jail while you're at home or? Okay. And how many how many calls do you think y'all have had together? No, I'm dead, bro. I mean, I can't count them more than anything. Okay, so y'all talk pretty regularly? I haven't listened to this, but apparently there may be some talk in the calls about what photographs. Have you given him any photographs? Mm -mm. I gave him a photograph of his mom, which he had asked for, and of his dog, Jax. Okay. Yeah. Have you given him any photographs of you? Mm -hmm. No, because I'm not. They, sh you know, I don't give any photographs of me, and we shake things down. They, they would find them, you know. So what do you think that he's going to say about this? Same thing. What do you mean the same thing? Like when I told you that we had something going on, you know, a few years back and he ended up here and I saw him and then, I mean, obviously like he already had my number, so it wasn't like that was top secret. And I um, How did he get your number? He had it from back then. Back then? Yeah. So he remembered it? And I've had, I've had the same number for since I was 50, so. All right, Greg, what do you got? So her admission is over now. She's locked down and that interrogator owns her. Now, here's the problem, Mark. You ask why they don't ask questions. One of the things you have to do when you get a person to a point you know they're lying and then you force them to answer the question is if you're not careful, you can feed them information that they will validate. 
And when Sharf did it, he would feed them information he did he knew the answer to to check and see how they would respond. And then he would poke and prod and make provocative statements where all that stuff comes from that caused them to give him more information. So what they do is they push her into a corner. Now they know she's lying. She's knows she knows they know that she knows she's lying. So to, go, to use a Dr. Phil thing, you got to be really careful and they're going to walk walk her through. But after she delays that response about having a certain conversation around sexuality, she moves to that front of the mouth talking. You know, I always say that, yeah, no. And she goes to fading facts and her voice just gets so soft you can barely hear her. She's adapting. She's now got her hand inside her thigh. She's squeezing her thigh and moving her hand around. Mark's why I said, I think you picked the best one. If you do nothing but that, you got her for this rest of this mm. entire thing. Yeah. When she's asked about the phone calls, now you see she's accepted it. You see that chin again, the same thing you pointed out earlier, Chase, that chin and that slow nod. The slowing of the nod is emotional response, and there's some grief or some shame in there, and her chin is now starting to drop to cover her throat. There's some distaste and a really heavy swallow at regularly. And then she's emphatic at the photographs, swallows her words and gives a question. There's no cause. Never mind. She droops off. And then just all of this stuff gets to the point where she's barely audible because she knows she's boxed in. Their job now is to make sure they don't feed her anything that she doesn't already know so they don't get a false confession and to validate what they already know and close the loop and force her into position. Scott, you always talk about boxing someone in. This is boxing. This is putting a person in a place where they have one door to go out and you control that door. So Scott, what do you got? All right. For, for the body language we've seen so far, again, this is a, a pretty big difference here. Uh, we see like you just covered the adapter on the leg and all that. So I'll, breeze past that we hear that big breath that big intake and then the out uh, or blowing out uh, of that air and that's a big a big red flag that says oh she's blowing off steam she's trying to get relaxed here so uh, for the question about the number of phone calls her blink rate skyrockets and we see that a little flutter of, of her, her blink rate as well so that says she knows th this it's pretty much over for her at this point so but these guys keep going so this is this is this is great this is great. So um, when um, when agreeing to the um, you all talk you all talk regularly. When he asked that, she's really quiet. And and so what we're seeing there, in my opinion, that's shame because two or three things going on. She knows she's busted. She knows it's embarrassing. She knows she shouldn't have done it. And so we're seeing shame on her on her. And the expression isn't that big, but everything about it tells us that she's feeling shame there. And again with a mm -mm, uh, when she's answered the question about. Um, Given the inmate photographs, but it was very, very high at the end. It went really high. So that's a red flag for me. They've talked about pictures. They've talked about her giving him uh, uh, photographs. And then um, she says, uh, or the interrogator says, what will he say about all this? And then she says, with fading facts, the same thing, it's just the same thing like that. So that is not, she's not. Um, necessarily lying about that, that shame as well, because if he does, she doesn't know what he's going to do. She knows he's going to come clean and say, this is what happened or not. So that's why we're hearing the fading facts there, because she doesn't know. I think that's part of, of the um, her being insecure about her answer there. So um, I think, and then when she says, I didn't give him any photographs because they would find them. I think she would have given him pictures. You know, I think she would have gone that far to give her given pictures of herself, um, but she knew they'd find him, and she says that. So, and I think they probably pick up on that. But that was kind of uh, that was kind of an obvious shooting a fish, you know, shooting fish in a barrel there. So, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I agree with uh, with with all of that. There's the self soothing with the thumb uh, on the leg there. Um, that yeah, Scott. I mean, if 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 anybody wants to see what a spike in blink rate looks like, just just watch the replay. Um, uh, how many calls? Several. I mean, I can't count them. Such a spike. It's just extraordinary. It's a it's the perfect. Yeah. It's the perfect uh, storm of that, um, and and to your point again, Scott, uh, uh, Scott, this whole this whole thing um, about the photographs. She then goes on to say they don't give any photographs to me. They don't give any photographs to me, which is that wasn't the question. The question was, do you give him photographs? She's then gone back to an old story where she has, I think, said that she has supplied photographs of family members and a dog 
to him, but they don't give photographs. So it's it's got completely muddled here. It's got, it's all, the story is all over the place. And as she says that, up comes the left hand to, to illustrate that. So again, my mind just goes, this left hand is telling us everything about what's going on. Every time she has uncertainty, every time she knows she's not confident about it, every time she knows she is creating something which is more of a story and way less factual, up comes the left hand and, and, and off she goes. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Absolutely agree. And I can say that in 99% of prisons, they will find those pictures. Shakedowns are really common. I think we talked in one video, maybe the previous video, or maybe the one before, about how the officers may not have been cuffing that person in the safest way possible in, in case of them screwing up. There was a comment of somebody that said, "Hey, stick to body language analysis. You're not. You're not. A, you're not. You don't. You don't do prisoner stuff." Really? Yeah. And I, I don't. But you I guys apologize. did. I was like, "Oh yeah, sorry. Well, sorry about that. We'll we'll stick to the body yeah. language." <laughs> yeah, like I ran, a person or two in our lives. Ran yeah, yeah. military detainee operations for four years <laughs> in my life. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that happens. Uh, definitely in prison, Sh cells are shook down all the time, and they're done usually at random, and they're on a random s generator so that a guard cannot select what cells will be chosen each day so they can't give somebody that's their friend a heads up like, hey, take your Adderall out of the top of the toilet and those kind of things. It's usually the number one thing we find is razor blades and Adderall. Those, basically. But this is a great example of progressive guilt that's just ramping up and ramping up. Greg, Scott, y'all talk about Prancer, Trancer, and Romancer. She's all the way in Donner and Blitzen here. <laughs> I agree with the, you. The guilt is showing, mm -hmm. uh, is progressively revealing way in her face and her body. And what she's doing with her language here is also really interesting to me. She's being more forthcoming and revealing, but still inserting little bits of vagueness and ambiguity in th these little pockets of detail. This is really common, and the way this guy handled it is so great. He's not going for the throat. He's not calling her out along the way, which is what you see in these TV interrogations. Yeah. Uh, think of stepping into a pool. He's letting her dip her toe into these tiny pieces of truth, and he's letting her try on the truth for a little, a uh, little bit. There's a lot going on here beyond the body language. So the, this exchange that's going on between them is pretty amazing because this guy is just gently allowing her to leave details out, and he knows he can come back and clean all of that up a little bit later. Her language is getting more and more comfortable revealing information, and I think. Maybe subconsciously, he's picking up on that. And the biggest thing, Scott, you said same thing. She she actually says, same thing I told him. Oh. Think about that. They say, what's he going to say if we pull him in here? And her answer is, same thing I told him. Not the same thing that happened. Same thing I told him. Hmm. That's a big deal, I think. Uh, I had to rewind it a couple of times. This is a pretty obvious accident, accidental slip, but there's something revealing about it. And I think this is perfect for training in a, a loss of verbal confidence. And Scott calls this fading facts because that ending part is so quiet of that. She gets softer and softer, and you even see that single shoulder shrug on her left shoulder. And she reveals what she's been telling him what to say or somehow pre maybe preparing him for an interview with the police. If this guy memorized her number, that's very significant. And what she said is a lie. Which also means if she gave him the number, this is also significant and a lie. So either way, interesting fact there. So the final thing she says, I've had the same number since I was 15. It's just a tiny little fade out. I don't even know if Zoom picked that up on, on the audio. It did. But, uh, that's another big fading facts thing. Scott, I love that uh, 
analogy, that that word, descriptor, whatever that's called. Nice. Yeah. Well, oh, thanks. Um, what kind of conversations have you had with him since you've started working here and he's been in the jail? Uh, I'll just talking about what would happen after he got out. Wow. And then the jail call recordings, have you been talking to him like while you're at home? Like he calls you from the jail while you're at home or? Okay. And how many, how many calls do you think y'all have had together? No, I'm. Yeah, bro. I mean, I can't count them more than. Okay. So y'all talk pretty regularly? I haven't listened to this, but apparently there may be some talk in the calls about, like, photographs. Have you given him any photographs? Mm -mm. I gave him a photograph of his mom, which he had asked for, and of his dog, Jax. Okay. Yeah. Have you given him any photographs of you? Mm -hmm. No, because I'm not. They, sh you know, I don't give any photographs of me, and we shake things down, they, they would find them, you know. So what do you think that he's going to say about this? Same thing. What do you mean the same thing? Like when I told you that we had something going on, you know, a few years back and he ended up here and I saw him and then, I mean, obviously like he already had my number, so it wasn't like that was top secret. And I don't know. How did he get your number? He had it from back then. Back then? Yeah. So he remembered it? And I've had, I've had the same number for since I was 15, so. I'm going to get the uh, recording of just the most recent call for us to listen to. Um, kind of my intent behind that is. I still don't fuck you. You're coming out with the whole thing. So, like I said, I'm not trying to badger you or nothing. Um, I just think that it's important that we know uh, exactly what happens. So initially, you said you kind of like played it off like you hardly knew him. I mean, I don't like brand new him. I just like, oh, you kind of like. Stood there and thought. Oh, right now, uh, right oh, now. Oh, Parker, yeah. I think he's in pot six. But I just looked in the system, there was like almost 400 calls. So, between y'all. Yeah. You see what I'm, you see where I'm coming from? Kind of how it was seen from my point mm -hmm. of view? I mean, you gotta hesitate a little bit, but. Like I said, no, no judgment here. I just want to know the truth. Let's, yeah. What's it? Let me know. Great. I should this. Hi, Mark. What do you got? Uh, yeah. What video are we on? Five. Um, five. Okay. Um, okay. Significant uh, gear shift for a. Uh, uh, in this, uh, the lips, the lips pucker up here, um, and she bars with her leg. First time we've seen her move from uh, these legs, both legs, feet down on the ground, to the leg coming up and causing a barrier and a bar. So she really knows that something is up now and something is coming, and she is now braced for that significant, Dude, significant move. I said that almost verbatim. That's crazy. Well, saved, That's saved you the time, hasn't it? Saved you. Yeah. <laughs> saved you the time. In fact, Scott, what have you got, if anything? <laughs> I, I, ju I just had my. <laughs> you just had my. <laughs> that was, that was a big deal. I, I, li I literally, literally said that she's bracing for the rest of the ride on that. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, there's not much she can do here because she she's busted. We start talking about the 400 phone calls and lets her know he already knows that. And he's, got, he's just dropping these old. Uh, breadcrumbs of, of evidence he's got against her, all this information that Mark pretty much said 
almost verbatim everything I was going to say. Uh, Greg, what do you got? I think he does a great job of not being judgmental at the same time he's saying, I got all this evidence. Look, I told you guys all the time, I've said, if you can't understand the genius behind 9-11, you can't interrogate the guy who did it. You have to suspend judgment when you're interrogating. No, you get to walk out and laugh like all hell or judge them afterward. Not like we don't. That's why you hear us giggle about how stupid these people are sometimes. So they get to the recordings and you can see she's got disdain and distaste. I mean, there's a whole lot going on in her face there. More sudden head movement, but this time it goes to a place. Boom. Down to the right to emotional eye accessing. She knows this is going to be impactful to the rest of her life. She doesn't yet know how much, but she does that chin involvement with her chin down over her throat and her chin bosses pushing to show to show shame. This is a really good indicator. She immediately moves to the first real barrier we've seen. She crosses over everything. It's really clear to her here, I think, and with that acceptance face again that she was doing when she nodded, that she's busted. But she doesn't seem to realize how big a deal it is, or her respiration, her blink rate, and all those things would go through the roof. This is a criminal charge. She doesn't seem to be paying attention to that. The detective is doing diligence now. He is poking around, figuring out what she's going to admit, what she isn't. He's doing that exact thing I said to prevent feeding somebody information about a false confession. It's a great job. These guys are doing a beautiful job. And we'll hear in a minute, or maybe they already said, these are homicide detectives. These are not people who, re who go in and do this every day. That should have been her red flag. Hey, I want an attorney. Trust me, if I get a homicide detective talking to me and they say, hey, you can leave if you want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. That's kind of, I'm probably calling Robert Barnes or somebody like that immediately. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I'd be. I've got Robert on speed dial. Yep. Uh, so the detective says he feels like she's still not willing to come out with the full story here, and she nods. She nods to that. She says, "Yeah, I get that." So she goes from this crossed ankles position, which I think in most cases means either relaxation or defiance, depending on the context. Uh, but then she pulls her leg up into this figure four leg cross. And I think this was named by Alan Pease, Barbara and Alan Pease, uh, but I'm not sure. But think about how you instinctively adjust your posture when you're solving a tough problem or you're making a big decision. You might sit up straight. You might lean forward. You might fidget a lot while you're making that decision. That's your body responding to cognitive load. Your brain is just burning off energy and your body is adjusting to keep up. So a lot of these shifts can be about boosting our focus, releasing some tension, or hiding something. So when people feel out of control, they tr often try to ground themselves physically. They cross their arms, they plant their feet, they fiddle with a pin to create a new sense of stability. So it's like a subconscious way of saying, I've got this, or I'm, a, I'm at least in control of this one little thing here. So the trick is to look at the context. Did the shift happen right after a tough question? Is it out of sync with their usual behavior? So timing and patterns matter more than the gesture itself. So these movements very, very often show somebody is deep in thought or trying to steady themselves emotionally not necessarily being deceptive or defensive. So that's not always what we're seeing. So if you ever see this, in a, if you're interviewing somebody for a job interview, or if you're asking your husband why he downloaded that networking app that just looks a little bit like a dating app, and you see this, those are two different contexts. But if you're just seeing the one thing and you're not seeing a cluster, keep that in mind. People who say, oh, you did this, and you're, so you're lying because I watched the behavior panel. You didn't listen well enough. I'm going to get the a recording of just the most recent call for us to listen to. Um, kind of my intent behind that is I still don't fuck you. You're coming out with the whole thing. So, like I said, I'm not trying to badger you or nothing. Um, I just think that it's important that we know uh, exactly what happens. So initially you said you kind of like played it off like you hardly knew him. I mean, I, I don't like I knew him. I just... Like, oh, you kind of like stood there and thought... Oh, right now, like, right oh, now. Parker, yeah. I think he's in pot six. But 
I just looked in the system, there's like almost 400 calls. So, between y'all. Yeah. You see, what I'm, you see where I'm coming from? Kind of how it was seen from my point of view? I mean, I hesitate a little bit, but... Like I said, no, no judgment here. I just want to know the truth. Let's, yeah. What's it? Let me know. Wait, I should this. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was never like, oh my God, I was a good Pokemon. You can of see how that sounds from like my point of view. A more, like a more recent thing than three years ago? No. No? No, I guess I don't. I've given it back before, and that's what he was referring to. And it was not in the jail? No. So do you think this dude's really going to cover for you? Like if I bring him in here and we start playing this and all that, you really think this dude's? He's going to tell you what I told you. Um, I need you to tell me this when y'all met and all this stuff, like, tell me that how all that happened with as much detail as you can tell me, like everything that you can remember. Well, we just exchanged numbers and met up a few times and well, I me mean, as more than just like in a bolt tights, but and that was it. Like I didn't at the time I didn't want to be in a relationship. I just got gotten out of a seven year relationship, so was I looking for anything serious? No. So like where did y'all how many times do you think y'all met up? Maybe more than five, less than ten. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember where we go met up at? Usually it was just like, I don't know, it's how I play. It wasn't anything like, it wasn't basic if I didn't want to date anybody and like, be on my shoe with anybody. It was kind of, I don't know. I didn't know. And where was he living at the time? Oh, uh, small. Where where is it at? Uh, in New Canaan. You know, what street or what, like what area in New Canaan it was in? I mean, I have horrible sense of direction. It's just in New Canaan. Uh, is it ninety? No, fifty nine. Wait, is there a ninety? No. Yeah, it was fifty nine. Is like the main freeway that runs through. But there's not a ninety, so then it must be fifty nine. Yeah, somewhere like. All right, Greg, what do you got? Mark, I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder. She pulls her fingers back. She curls her fingers immediately. This is interesting to me because there have been studies, if you ever watch, where they put your hands on camera and then stab it with a knife and people pull their hands back because we don't recognize our own hands very well. We look at our face one one thousandth of the time that we look at our hands, but we don't recognize our hands. And I've always said I believe that's because they're our first tools. They're our most important things that we ever ever had as a species it changes the way our, our world is. And I think people retract their hands and do that kind of thing when they're feeling threatened often. You'll see it. She does it here. And then she adapts on the other leg now. She switched legs. She's ambidextrous. She's adapting now on the right. Her per She does purse lips at disapproval. And there's just a whole lot going on here. This is like a kid who's called on the carpet. Again, I don't think she yet understands how dangerous this is. But if you call your kid in, Chase, you've said about calling him in about spilling chocolate milk. This is the behavior you expect, not hey, I'm going to shut up and get a lawyer and get out of here. I don't think she's keenly aware of that yet. She's still trying to declare in her innocence, but not demonstra demonstrably. We typically think when a person's angry, they're emphatic. I didn't do anything. I did do this. I don't know what you're talking about. She's saying, I didn't do it. No, I just still, I don't think she gets the gravity. Oh, the older you get, the more you realize that this is a, a typical t trick. We're going to bring you two in here and we're going to see how 
this person says that people do use it at work, people use it in prison, people use it everywhere. That's an age old sharp thing. That's a, hey, look here, I got this idea. I'm going to tell you this story. And we say, okay, what is your friend that we captured you with? Thing. I would say that the calmest interrogator usually is the hardest to, to resist. When I was in Seer, I'll give you a Seer story. I tried to say I was there by myself. Well, none of us are there by ourselves because we were captured with a whole bunch of people. And this guy was really calm, really contained. And he said, okay, he asked me about 50 questions and I knew he was on to me. And he said, who were you with? And I said, I was with nobody. He said, okay, put me back in my cell. Well, guess what he did? Then he brings everybody in the room and he says, who knows this guy? What do you think that causes for you? Well, you get yourself in a bind. And so this is the way you, he's using this. Another time I'll tell you how I got out of that story. It was an easy one, but it was a fun one. Uh, we, this is another example of the Sharfian we know all. It just shows a combination of techniques between Reed and Sharf is more powerful than using Reed alone. These guys are using a whole system of true Sharfian interrogation and Reed. Watcher, I'll just leave it alone. The last thing, I love these fake lashes, Chase, you said it in the beginning, because those adapters and her playing with those things, now she's starting to notice that in addition to her eyelids flutter. You can't Mark, let us go without, you got to give us the end of the story, dude. So, I... I I had a back injury when I was young, and I'd been tied up that day for a while, so my back hurt. And I realized the best thing I can possibly do is make everybody know that they don't want to be associated with me right now. And so when they got me to the gate, a guy said, did they beat you with something? Oh, and I was just said, they know I'm an interrogator. Well, you can imagine how quickly that spread through the compound. And it spread through the compound well enough that within 10 minutes when he brought me out and stood me in front of the formation, and they said, who knows this guy? Dead silence. Nobody wanted to be associated with an interrogator. Or an wow. intelligence guy, because Chase, as you know, special treatment for special people. You're always careful when you get in those situations. Uh, Mark, what do you got on the hands? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, the the fingers retract. Why? Because if you get these damaged, you can't manipulate tools in order to get yourself food and you can't hardly feed yourself. So now, because we're social mammals as well, not only is it not good for us, it's not good for our whole group because now you've become a drain on your group, on your tribe, on your society. Hence, in warfare, landmines, because when you get somebody with a landmine, you're not trying to kill them. You're trying to maim them enough that they're going to be a drain on their whole family and friends and everybody. They take everybody down because we have this innate, you know, human will to keep people alive, even when they're a drain on us. It's a wonderful thing, but uh, used often uh, in landmine warfare. Anyway. I digress slightly. We have spike uh, of activity and gestures uh, when she wants to get more accurate with uh, the interrogators, the interviewers about where he lived. And there is quite a spike in how accurate she wants to get. She wants to get this really right for them. You know, was it this number or that number? I forget. What is it? How far does that street go? Mm, I wonder. <laughs> so she's trying to be, there's a spike in kind of helpfulness, a spike in, in trying to get um, accurate about stuff. That left hand starts getting involved as well. So I suddenly go, well, there's something a little inauthentic about this spike in helpfulness and accuracy. My guess would be is that the guy was round at her house now and again, and she knew exactly where he was a lot of the time because he wasn't where he was living all of the time. He may well have been round where she was living at the time and she's trying to protect that story as well minimize that idea that's just speculation i don't know i have no evidence for that i'm just making it up it's a story we're all making up <laughs> stories me and her clearly uh chase what do you got on this one she's now holding these fists on her lap the clip doesn't show it but uh how it happens but this is usually a sign of three one of three things a threat an embarrassment or a desire for concealment. So she was likely just listening to something pretty revealing on this tape. Now I'm saying it's probably threat and embarrassment at the same time. And it it's is. weird to see her go along with the detective saying that he's going to cover for her. Like, why would I say that someone's going to cover for me? That automatic, that just means they're going to lie. So she's kind of just gone along with this uh, strangely, which I, I don't see very often. I don't r remember seeing it in the last 10 years. And then her just saying, he's going to tell you what I told you or what I told you. 
And how many times do you think y'all met up? This is what the detective asked. There's a prolonged hesitancy with down left. And she hasn't had that before, which means that's a deviation from baseline. So it's a prolonged hesitancy with her looking down and left, which we associate, uh, which is, I guess, technically, there is research for it. And I see this in about 85 to 90 percent in in my experience, which I guess is research in deception. So I have long, prolonged hesitancy and prolonged down left eye movement. This is usually some kind of mental dialogue that's going on. So it's usually not retrieval. Usually people are different, but especially since we've seen her baseline and we know this is different. She's just giving out random numbers uh, to fill space. This is an information dump of of relevant things so she can feel like there's some form of of an exchange. And it's not always a deception strategy. Sometimes you see this in people who are withholding information and this causes anxiety and they'll do this unconsciously to feel like they're communicating and being forthright, like there's some kind of exchange going on. They'll just start vomiting data. You see this at a party when somebody talks too much because they're concealing something about themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, oh my God, look, I did talk when... He kind of seemed how that sounds from like my point of view, like a more recent thing than three years ago. No. No? No. I guess I don't. I've given it before, and that's what he was referring to. And it was not in the jail? No. So do you think this dude's really going to cover for you? Like, if I bring him in here and we start playing this and all that, you really think this dude's? Yeah. He's going to tell you what I told you. Um, I need you to tell me this when y'all met and all this stuff. Like, tell me that how all that happened with as much detail as you can tell me. Like, everything that you can remember. Well, we just exchanged numbers and met up a few times and well, me as well, and it just like, you know, both times, but that was it. Like, I didn't, at the time, I didn't want to be in a relationship. I just got gotten out of a seven year relationship. So was I looking for anything serious? No. So like, where did y'all, how many times do you think y'all met up? Maybe more than five, less than ten. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember where we go met up at? Usually it was just like, I don't know, it's how I play. It wasn't anything like, it wasn't basic if I didn't want to date anybody and like, be on my shoe with anybody. It was kind of, I don't know. And where was he living at the time? Oh, uh, small. Where where is that at? Uh, in New Canaan. You know, what street or what, like what area in New Canaan it was in? I mean, I have horrible sense of direction. It's just in New Canaan. Uh, is it 90? No, 59. Wait, is there a 90? No. Yeah, it was 59 is like the main freeway that runs through. But there's not a 90. So then it must be 59. Yeah, somewhere like that. Okay, so walk me through how y'all got to talking when y'all see each other in the jail again or whatever. Like, how did how did how did it build to this to where y'all are talking almost four hundred times? Um, I'd seen him, and uh, I mean, of course, I recognized him, and he recognized me, but it was just it wasn't nothing like. I mean, my thoughts weren't like I was going to pursue anything, you know, I can't speak for like his thoughts at the time, but it wasn't anything like that. Um, and, you know, 
he was respectful. He never, you know, did anything to like signal or anything. Um, and, uh, I guess I had gotten a message from his mom saying that I guess like Jake had talked to her and he mentioned that I was, you know, here and he just told her to tell me like that he loved me or he missed me or he saw me. I don't remember. Like something like that. Was she and then asked if he can call me and me. Okay. So, but it was over, over the course of, like, it wasn't just like one day. He was like, "Oh, I saw you," and then he just started calling. Me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, his mom reached out to you. Yes, yeah, I mean this. I mean, I've had her on Facebook. Okay, so she sent you like a Facebook message. Yeah. Okay. What is her name? I mean, I don't know her name is. What? I mean, I don't want to get her involved in like this mess you know it's it's really just like details of the store there's ways i can find it anyways it's probably his emergency contact in jail i mean i don't know what's your name it's the cake up and i and i just will just keep it as but i mean if they'll figure it out obviously i'm like you know y'all can do that but i don't want to drive that either okay um. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't anything like that. It wasn't anything like that, she says, and we get an asymmetrical pull up in the side of the mouth. Damn. Yeah, you lost there, yep. Chase. I went, I got there first. You know, all, all you're going to be left with is to disagree with me. Let me see if I can give you something disagreeable. Uh, well um. I don't, it's, it's, it's hard because you can't see the other side of the face, but I don't think I see enough uh, muscle movement on the other side to think that there's anything symmetrical going on there. So it is asymmetrical. So uh, disdain or contempt, what for, for the situation, for herself, I don't know, I'm not a mind reader, could be duper's delight, I don't think so, it doesn't seem subtle enough, it seems quite big, that's the only contention I can give you there, Chase, that you could come in and go, it is, it is duper's delight, let's see, let's see whether you do. Um, the hand really gets uh, acting and communicative uh, around, so the, the, the left hand again, which is when she starts telling stories, um, about um, communicating through the mother, again, all minimised, I guess like uh, he talked to her, just told her to tell me he loved me, he missed me, he saw me, something like that. Wow, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty major. If somebody's mum <laughs> goes, oh, by the way, will you tell her you... <laughs> <laughs> he, he told me to tell you he loves you, he misses you, he saw you, like something like that. Look, it was probably that or nothing like that. You probably would remember somebody, especially if they're in prison and you know them and somebody's mother comes to you and says, here's what he says about you. That would be probably etched in your memory. So why are you being selective about the memory of this or minimizing this and there's your left hand going again there it is again so minimization distancing all of that stuff chase what do you got anything different well i disagree only with your hair <laughs> your face, your face. <laughs> and the, way, the way that you pronounce pattern is uh i just can't i can't get on board it's fair with that. it's fair uh, everything else I agree with. But <laughs> there is a definite pattern here. <laughs> if you're a subscriber, I want you to see if you spot it. So our subscribers learn about this stuff all the time. And I talk about how to spot this a lot in our other videos. So does Mark Scott and Greg. There is a pattern that's been exposing itself here for a while, since the very first video that we watched. And we always talk about how important it is to be able to spot somebody's behavioral patterns in a response to conflict. So if you're a subscriber, when we log in to read the comments in the app, it's called YouTube Studio. It's a separate little thing. Uh, there's a red circle next to your name 
that tells us you're a subscriber. And when we're scrolling through, we, we can see those little red circles, and obviously we prioritize that. But I would love to hear from you if you've been able to spot this pattern because it reveals a shocking way that this suspect could be made to divulge just about anything. So if you're going to write your thoughts, remember to think about what you're seeing at a base level. And I'll add this as a link in the, in the description if you want to download a full graphic of it. But here are the things I want you to look for. What have you seen so far in terms of these few patterns here? Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, friend, flex, focus, and follow. All of those things. What are those little... I deal with conflict this way, patterns. So we have like a porcupine who wants to fight, set some boundaries, staying well protected. We have like a chihuahua who wants to flex, so hyperreactive, overcompensating. We have the turtle, which is a freeze, total withdrawal, protective isolation. We have a rabbit, which is flight, just nimbleness, need to escape. And we have the fox, which is maybe a friend, socially smart, cooperative, only when they're needed, when they need to do it. And then we have the wolf, which is focus. They're very vigilant about surroundings. They're ready for a fight. Then we have the sheep, which are follow. I'm going to follow along with what everybody else is doing in the room. Cooperative, aligns with the group for safety. And finally, we have a puppy. And this is fawn, seeking approval through submissive behavior or seeking safety through submissive behavior. I felt like I went too long, but it didn't actually feel that long. No, but we, we actually call subscribers, we call those panelists. Yes. We so do. if you're a subscriber, you're a panelist automatically. Yep. Welcome to the panel. Yeah. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm not going to cover the same things you guys covered. This is another really good example of an interrogator knowing when not to say, hey, you stupid little shit, we got all this information, why don't you just roll over? They don't. They do a great job. And when you're teaching interrogation, there are really two styles of questioning. I mean, there, you can name thousands, but there's concentric, progressively tightening question. And then there's a scatter kind of scatter plot where you go and pick up pieces of information and then paint the picture, much like Columbo. These guys are doing that concentric circle approach. They're tightening the noose. She ropes around her neck and she knows it now. You can see it. You're starting to see pieces of it. But what they're doing is a control release version of facts so they're gathering as much detail as they can without feeding her any back to ensure they're getting the right thing this is a really good example of concentric questioning dora vasquez helner i worked with her on um the history channel we can make you talk she is a master concentric questioner can break people with nothing but questions and so if you ever want to go see somebody who does a good job, she does exactly that. Very Sharfian, very calm, very contained. This kid gives her all this information in exchange for a cookie and protection from a threat. Neither one of those is better than the other. They're just different styles in how you work. Sharf would give erroneous information to confirm it or, or deny it and see how the person is going to respond. And this is what they're doing. They know the answer. Um, anyway, the last thing I'd share is you might ask yourself, how could a person possibly do something this stupid? But people do this every day at work, every day. They get to a position, they have their work husband or work wife, and they cross the line and go to a sexual encounter with that person. Not fundamentally different, just not criminal. So think about all the people you've known and in your life, you've probably known at least one person who's done something very similar to this. And if you can put yourself in that mindset, you can question. And that's what these guys are doing. And they've got her on the ropes because at the very end of this, she's barely above a whisper when she talks. You can't even hear her. Mark, Could what do you, you got? Could you do that again, Greg? Yeah, sure. I'm sure I will. Scott's got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've been. Oh, I'm sorry, be... Scott. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I covered everything. I didn't have a whole lot here anyway. So instead of going back over everything, we'll move along. Okay. So walk me through how y'all got to talking when y'all see each other in the jail again or whatever. Like, how did how did how did it build to this to where y'all are talking almost four hundred times? Um, I'd seen him, and uh, I mean, of course, I recognized him, and he recognized me, but it was just. There wasn't nothing like 
I mean, my thoughts weren't like I was going to pursue anything, you know, I can't speak for like his thoughts at the time, but it wasn't anything like that. Um, and, you know, he was respectful. He never, you know, did anything to like signal or anything. Um, and, uh, I guess I had gotten a message from his mom saying that I just like Jake Pat talked to her and he mentioned that I was, you know, here and he just told her to tell me like that he loved me or he missed me or he saw me. I don't remember. Like something like that. Was she and then asked if he can call me and me. Okay, so but it was over, over the course of like it wasn't just like one day he was like oh I saw you and then he just started calling me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he his mom reached out to you. Yes, yeah, I mean this. I mean I've had her on Facebook. Okay, so she sent you like a Facebook message. Yeah. Okay. What is her name? I mean I don't know her name is. Why I mean I don't want to get her involved in like this mess you know it's it's really just like details of the store there's ways i can find it anyways it's probably his emergency contact in jail i mean i i don't know what's your name it's the cake up and i and i just will just keep it as but i mean if they'll figure it out obviously i'm like you know y'all can do that but i don't want to drive that either okay um, uh, so there's obviously 400 jail calls and I'm going to have to go through all of those. Is there anything that's going to pop up that's not jiving with your, what you're telling me today? Nothing so, I mean... I guess we've been talking and it's been what it's been. So I I just say that. Like, like, what, well, like, what do you mean? Like, am I, like, obviously there's something going on between us. Like, do you mean like, like, what am I, what do I need to tell you? Like, there's something going on between us. I just, I mean, you know, here? if y'all had sexual contact inside of this jail. No. With my, with what I'm trying to find out. No. None at all, anywhere. Okay. You have any questions coming along, Chris? Yes. So I noticed one thing. I want you to understand this about both of us. Both of us are veteran homicide detectives, okay? I've been doing this a lot. All right. You seem to have flanks in your memory when we get to certain details, but you remember being groped in the three years ago. I find that hard to believe. Okay. This is your one chance to be honest with us. Yes. Once we get up and walk out and we're done, mm. we're done. Yeah. And honesty is the only thing that's going to help you with us. Mm. So my advice to you right now is to be honest with us. Have you all had any inappropriate contact, whether it's groping Yes, I am being vulgar to get a point across. Yeah, no, it's not. None of that. Um, then what is it? Uh, I'm a good to In fact, are the clock? How long ago was that? Uh, I don't know. A few months ago. A few months ago? How long have you worked here? Uh... Since April. Since April this year? Mm -hmm. Was he already here? He was already here. Okay. Do you know how long he's been here? I don't know. That's not top of my head. Hey, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so as I said right at the start, I love this bit because we've seen so many other interrogations where often they've done the good work of of staying off the hard questioning and getting somebody to a certain point. And, you know, we've all at some point said, 
damn, if they'd only have just laid down this moment, this question, they'd have probably got, you know, more information or in this case, a, a confession, I would say. Well, I wouldn't say. I mean, they, get, they absolutely get a confession to a criminal act. So what happens here, in my view? Uh, they put forward a description, an idea. She says it's not none of that. OK, it's not none of that. OK, there's a double negative in there, but let's not even get involved in that. She negates it. She negates their description and goes, no, not that. They ask a great question, which is, well, what then? Well, what? Because now they ask for her description of it. The description she gives is a criminal act. She goes straight into a confession. So absolutely, they've got her to the right place over all of these videos but it is very rare that people will take somebody's negation of a description and then go, OK, so what do you say? You describe it. And listen, if you take away anything from this, when somebody negates something that you've put forward, take the opportunity to go, OK, well, what is it then? You tell me. Instead of what we've seen other interrogators do is get defensive about the negation and go, OK, and start to get hard and push more ideas and push more ideas and push, push, push their description. They back right off and go, you describe it. And there she is confessing at that point. I think that's lovely. It's a perfect move. It's beautifully done. Greg, what do you think? I think part of the reason it works is because she responds well to authority because she's institutionalized. Remember, if you're working in a prison, two of us have you're institutionalized the same way the prisoners are. There's just a different that you can come and go, but there's a lot of ritual, a lot of that associated. And I think she responds to authority very well. And that one officer is on it. He gets it. Look, I can, I'm going to call BS, boom, 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 and goes at her pretty hard. And I think that's part of the reason she rolls, Mark. I, I, I think it's beautiful. She starts off in a new position. She's barriered and in sacred space. She's milling and, and fidgeting and trying to make herself comfortable. And the reason I call it sacred space is if I block you out and rub my hands, I've now got space and I'm also making myself more comfortable because all an adapter is, is a repetitious move you do that makes the unknown known or the uncomfortable comfortable. Right if she says after no sexual, if she, after she says no sexual contact, there's a lip compression and that chin boss comes up. I see you people use that for an emphatic all the time. And I think that's kind of what she's doing. But when she says, obviously something was going on, it's game over. That is game over. She's given them something that allows them to lock her down. And that guy steps in with authority and that finishes it. And I agree with you, Mark. Beautiful example of a real confession. Usually what you do is once you get the break and the confession, then you get to go in and fill in the details. And this, these guys understand it. They're not judgmental. They're just saying, boom, we got it. Now we can go back and fill out any details we want. And they do further in this video. Go back to that Lotify guy. You can see the entire video and the entire phone call that's very graphic that we didn't cover here. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, for such a brazen question for this this woman to have the answer, no, she sure doesn't. There's not much there at all. There's not a whole lot. The emotion for that doesn't stay. And there should be emotion with that. It should stay if she's going to try to defend it. But I think she's pretty much given up so far. So we don't see any big defense. We don't see a big blow up of, well, here's what I think. And I, you think that it's not true. None of that, which is at that point where you're going to be doing it if you're going to be doing it. So I think she's pretty much just given up. But the, we see stress in her mouth and her hands all over her. We hear fading facts. We see eye blocking. I think the eye blocking is when she closes her eyes too long. And then, uh, but then the reverse of that, we see that blink rate go up. Then her breath rate grow up, uh, go up during this as well. So that's really interesting. And then when the when the bad cop steps in, <laughs> he he starts telling her all these graphic things that you'll have to go watch the original from on uh, what's the guy's channel, uh, Greg? Lotify, L A W T I F Y. Yeah, you'll be able to hear it there. I just couldn't. We don't talk like that on here, so I had to take that. Blow his side up. Make him happy. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, yeah, I had to duck that and take that out. But at that point, that's when she almost locks down completely. She almost freezes into a statue. Uh, but she does come clean at, the, at that point. So at, it, she comes clean and tells the truth and owns up to it. So uh, you got to give her a little respect for that. So that's, that's how I see it anyway. You can't just dump on her and you know let that be it so 
All right, we good? Oh, is that everybody? Chase. Oh. Well, Chase, why don't you go next? <laughs> I, I guess I'll go. I mean, if it's not an inconvenience to you or anything. It is. But it's, it's cool. Kind of revenge. Ahead, but, yeah. revenge. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my revenge. <laughs> so there's perfection here with the questioning. This is also an opportunity to use an alternative question and a monologue. I, I get it that they got I get that they got the confession. For me, hearing the monologue and alternative question is like when you study music theory and you come back to the home chord at the end and it's just like duh and everything just comes back and just finishes everything off nice and clean. My my ears need to hear it for some reason, even though they did a great job. Would have loved to see that. But if you just want to know what to look for when this clip is about to come back up on your screen here in about 28 seconds. You're going to see head retraction, loss of fluency, repetition, fidgeting, pacifying with the thumbs, inability to answer a simple question, reframing the answer, seeking a secondary question, re repetition of the answer, chin boss movement, lip compression, and a complete lack of a confident denial. All in one beautiful Christmas wrapped present for you. So when I say alternative question, all I mean is what we're doing, we're offering somebody two choices, which assume guilt, uh, but they differ in their reasoning and why it happened. So one option is framed as way more socially acceptable and the other is horrible, uh, way less flattering. So it's like we're offering a softer reason for helping their family if somebody stole money instead of you're just a bad human being and you're funding the mob. It's like, did you take the money to help your family? Or did you do this for personal gain because you're selfish? I want people to know. That's a super over-exaggerated example, but that's what that's what a alternative question is. Let's have another. You know what? People still think me and you're fussing in here, man. They think yeah. that they think we're going back and forth. It's real from that. Um, what yeah. did? Well, yeah. I can't remember what the first one was. We were goofing off. And they're like saying, well, you know, Scott is being rude. And they're like, Chase is being rude. So they're getting into it in there over me, over me. And you think you're actually fussing. It's the I best. Be, I blame that's your fault. Well, you're stupid. <laughs> your face is stupid. You what did you call it? Up. What was the face thing? You I, said I told face? Mark, you're irrational. And he yeah, said, yeah, your, yeah, face your, face, your face is irrational. Face. That's what it was. <laughs> uh -huh. So there's obviously 400 jail calls, and I'm going to have to go through all of those. Is there anything that's going to pop up that's not jiving with your what you're telling me today? Not going to sell me. I guess we've been talking, and it's been what it's been. So I I just say that. Like, what, well, like, what do you mean? Like, am I? Like, obviously, there's something going on between us. Like, do you mean, like, like what am I, what do I need to tell you? Like, there's something going on between us. I just, I, you know, here? if y'all had sexual contact inside of this jail. No. With my, with what I'm trying to find out. No. Okay. None at all. Anywhere. You have any questions coming along, Chris? Yes. So I noticed one thing. I want you to understand this about both of us. Both of us are veteran homicide detectives, okay? I've been doing this a lot. All right. You seem to have flanks in your memory when we get to certain details, but you remember being groped in the from three years ago. I find that hard to believe, okay? This is your one chance to be honest with us. Yes. Once we get up and walk out and we're done, we're done. Yeah. And honesty is the only thing that's going to help you with us. Mm. So my advice to you right now is to be honest with us. Have you all had any inappropriate contact, whether it's groping? Yes, I am being vulgar to get a point across. Yeah, no, it's not. None of that. Um... Then what is it? Uh, I'm a good In fact, hard B, quite. 
How long ago was that? Uh, I don't know. Few months ago. Few months ago. How long have you worked here? Uh, since April. Since April this year. Mm -hmm. Was he already here? He was already here. Okay. Do you know how long he's been here? Don't know. All right. Well, we've seen some things that might have changed our opinions on what actually happened and what was going to happen uh, from what we thought at the beginning. Mark, what's your verdict on this? Yeah, let me go back to your artist analogy. If if you are thinking about being, you know, somewhat expert, and, and maybe if it is something of an art, reading body language, I'm not sure uh, that it is because art would be a self-expression for me. It would be craft because you are taking ideas and putting them towards an end goal. But let's just say it is an art. Let's go down that route. One thing that somebody once told me about art is when you become a great artist, it's about what you don't do as opposed to what you do do, what you decide to leave aside, what you decide to put away. And I would say just on this particular one, I was able to make a decision right at the start to go, hang on, that left hand seems to be doing stuff which is out of baseline even for her let's just concentrate on that and look at nothing else and some people would say well that's bad craft to be doing that but i would say that's nah, probably really good art to be doing that to be focused to decide what you're going to pay attention to and decide what you're not going to pay attention to having said all that i really wouldn't say that reading body language is an art in any way it is science uh, though you know some of it isn't based on what you might say is a relevant study chase what do you think yeah i guess cooking is also a science yes it is so a lot of great stuff here detectives did a fabulous job but we saw a behavioral pattern from the very beginning that i think they may be unconsciously exploited through some of these methods I'm a huge proponent of stand-up interrogations. I've never seen it done, but I think we'd get more body language out. If we had like a bar height table, the square, <laughs> one investigator standing there, you get a lot more body language, a lot more movement. Hey, let's give it a shot. And that's all I got. Great, what do you got? I've done some stand-up interrogations. They're usually pretty intense when you're doing a stand-up interrogation. You know, they, they involve a little terror and that kind of thing with people. They're terrified because it's so awkward. So it's unnatural, but I agree you get a little more body language maybe. A couple things. This is a beautiful example of not going just for closing on a confession. Because Reed is really good at, I got enough information, I'm going to push you in the corner and I'm going to get a confession out of you. Sometimes you get a false confession because you feed them information. They were masterful at two things. Number one, not feeding too much information to get a false confession back. Number two, they probably have a vested interest in figuring out, is this the only time this happened? Or is there something else going on? They're investigating. They're not simply trying to get her to say, yeah, I did it. They could have, they had her. Look, they could have gone and said, I got 400 phone calls and here's one where you're talking about the act. That's all they have to do. But then they would not have the opportunity to feed her incremental information, get feedback from her, figure out whether this was a one-off thing or whether it was a lot, there was a lot more going on. And I think they did a great Sharfian interrogation of getting on her side and she almost did not even identify. I think it took three videos before she realized she's being interrogated. That's a beautiful example of interrogation. You shouldn't know it's happening. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you 100%. And I, I think interrogation is an art. That's the way I look at it because if you, there's a protocol you follow and there's a, there's an analytical part of it you got to follow. But once you get in there, man, it's like everybody always complains about the read technique and all that. But if you approach it from a, a, a standpoint of being organic so you can move things around and, and you know, kind of push this here and squish that there and put a little hat on it and glasses, whatever you want to do, then it changes and you can make it yours. So I think there's a, there's an art to that and be able to still pull it off so it works great. You know, so and I and I agree with your thing about body language, though, though too, Mark, about that, you know, whether it's an art or not, you know, because there is a lot of science. One time, uh, Chase, you had the best thing about whether body language was uh, a pseudoscience. And you said something about what was it about tennis? You said you had a yeah, story about 
tennis is there's no studies that no one's done roger federer has not conducted scientific studies and can't cite studies for why he wins tennis matches but he's hit a bazillion balls and he knows how to do it and yeah it's yeah, a, so it's an art that uses science not a science that uses art there you go you know, yeah my standard answer is <laughs> yeah and if there wasn't so much science to back it up then that'd be different if there weren't so many studies we could cite and just sit there for three days until people went dude give it a rest i get it i'm time i i understand we ought to do that one time sit here and give studies about what we get it's also the most viewers. difficult things to replicate in a lab like i'm gonna study yeah. detainee operations and, and intelligence interrogation using a 21 year old college kid who's doing this in a lunch room for a lunch voucher yeah. 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 Oh, that should be the same. Let's take those. Burger King and nine dollars. Yeah. 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 And to your point about cooking, Chase, if cooking is not a science and an art at the same time, then how come I got to study at Harvard with Ferran Adra and the Dean of Chemistry at the same time? Your face got to study at Harvard with them. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't good. I take it back. I should say that one. <laughs> So anyway, back to my my ending here. Yeah, I, I really like this one. I thought it was awesome because we see her. We can see this dawn on her. What's happening? And you're right, Greg. They had all this opportunity. You, you, you could go in and say, "Hey, look, here's what I got. Listen to this." You know, and she listens to it. And goes, "Okay, well, I'm busted. Yeah, I did that." But no, they use the opportunity. Took the opportunity to get as much information as they could from that about other people and about other situations going on in there. They're collecting information. They did a great job of that, I think. So, and it, but then again, it doesn't dawn on her what's happening until she gets into it because she's not worried at all. And if we compare, we can know that because we can compare the body language from the very first video to that last video we watched. Man, it's it's two completely different things, two completely different things. So that's what I think. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one, and we'll see you next time. Oh, hey, didn't see you there. You're at the end of the video. Not many people make it this far. And to reward you, I'd like to do a prank with you on the people who didn't watch the video to this point. What we're going to do, if you've made it this far, we're going to drop a comment down below about how you really loved the pizza box technique that we shared with you tonight, even though we didn't. Uh, it's going to keep people wondering what the hell you're talking about. And you and me, you and us, we're going to play a prank on everybody that didn't make it this far in the video. The pizza box versus the foot. There you go. There How's you that? go. I like that. All right. That's what we have. Yeah, it's the pizza box versus the, the old woman's foot. <laughs>